They have it, just a, a, an idea of what it took to create the Malmstrom, the Malmstrom com Missile Complex. Here's a map of it. Our active missile complex is larger than the state of Maryland. It's 13,800 square miles. In fact, our missile complex is so large, it is twice the size. It's larger than F.E. Warren and Minot combined. And then if you were to take Maryland and put it in our missile complex, you would see it not only encompasses Maryland, but Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, PA, and various bases all over the place. So it is a vast area. And can you imagine being out there, being those maintenance teams, doing all that work, traveling all over the place, trying to do it quickly. So John F. Kennedy had his ace in the hole to end the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, I'm sure one of the questions you may have is it's so vast. How do we communicate with each other? As you can see, all these lines are communication lines. They're called Hicks lines, and I'll describe that to you in a minute. It's a huge intricate webbing of these cables that allow each flight area to stay in command and control of all their sorties. So you'll see, uh, you probably can't see back there, but I'll point it out to you. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo. Those flights comprise the 10th missile squadron. And each flight is responsible for 10 sorties. We can, when you're out on alert, when we're out on alert, you can monitor all 50 sorties because of this intricate webbing connects everything. So there's, there's computers, there's brains out there at every sortie, every missile. And it continuously sends signals back and forth to the LCC to give us status. That status is then reported over here on our visual display units, on our VDUs. So if you were uh, upstairs or out there on alert, you would see a grid. It would say Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo. And you'd see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And you'd have a grid. And within that grid, you just match it up to which sortie it is. And that area will give you the status of your sortie, whether anything's going on. And this is how we're able to accomplish that. All that information comes back into what we call an ESA room, back into uh, it's the back end of the capsule on the outside, comes into an ESA room, and then it's delivered through all these intricate cables and everything throughout the capsule into our console to allow us to get the status on what's going out there in this field. And as Arnori pointed out to you, there's some arrows pointing at each of the flights within the, the 10th Missile Squadron. And then now imagine yourself driving from an hour to two hours to get out to one of the sites. And you see just a, you know, just a building out there in the middle of the field. It doesn't look like much. It's surrounded with a fence. And then you'll underneath that building, you'll have a uh, tunnel junction, and then that's our capsule. It's almost like the egg in the middle. And then there's our escape hatch, in case anything happens topside over here. All right, and then here's a little bit of a, here's a look at the LFs. Like I told you, we had all of our flights, and this huge intricate webbing allows us to talk to all of our LFs. So here's a little diagram of what an LF looks like in our support building to the ELF. Also, if you were to be out there at one of the sites with the ELFs, you would see a large pole in the middle of the site. A large white pole just sticking out of the ground. It's called the Impus, it's called the Impus pole. And it allows for OZ security. That's the outer zone security. So it does a Doppler picture, almost like a radar, Doppler picture. Keeps taking that picture. And if a, a subsequent picture changes, because like let's say a mouse or a rabbit or a person got on site, we would receive an indication through that intricate webbing over here that would say OZ for the applicable site that was on there. Then we'd hurry up, we'd jump on our phone, declare a security situation to our security controller topside, and then he would look at um, his, his, what's called an RVA, Remote Visual Assessment, and a little camera. We have cameras at all of our sites. And while simultaneously deploying a security forces team to go out there and find out what's going on. 
And there's also an inner zone security. I really didn't talk too much about it. There's an inner zone security that's set up like little circuit breakers. It, these circuit breakers, you know, if a door is jarred or anything like that, break and break, thus giving us an IZ indication over there on our VDU. And they're able, the IZ system's able to pick up vibration too. Now, here's a diagram of what that Hicks cable that I was talking about. This huge integral web. I think it's, uh, it might be 1,754 miles of this type of cable is spread all over Montana. And it is layered. So the outer shell of what's buried, you'll just see this black cable going. But it's layered. You have this armor copper bronze in the middle. You have the outer jacket. Then you have the armor copper bras, uh, bronze. Then you have the separator jacket, and then you go to tape, and then all these individual lines are responsible for the different communication. Even our voice communication, our hardened voice uh, communication, HVC, is within this Hicks cable and allows us to talk to all the capsules and our squadron command post uh, via just picking up the phone, hitting a button, and we can get everybody up on the line at the same time. And it's hardened, so in case ever a nuclear detonation or anything like that happens, we can still keep in communication with each other. Are there any questions so far? All right. And here's uh, another video giving you some great information about the 10th Missile Squadron, the history, and uh, what we do. The end of the Cold War brought about a veritable cornucopia of changes. On June 1, 1992, Strategic Air Command stood down and responsibility for the nation's nuclear forces transferred to the newly created United States Strategic Command. Responsibility for Air Force's ICBMs, including the 10th Strategic Missile Squadron, went to the newly created Air Combat Command. Conversion from Minuteman 2 to Minuteman 3 in the 10th began in 1992, but halted in January 1994 due to non-availability of the Minuteman 3 missiles with only 30 Minuteman 3s in place throughout the 10th, 12th, and 490th. The last of the 10th missiles was removed from Echo 10 on August 23, 1994. Other system upgrades were undertaken at the same time, including the installation of the Rapid Execution and Combat Targeting Console with Echo Launch Control Center being the first. Echo Launch Control Center was completed May 18, 1995, and the 10th, was the first squadron in the 341st Space Wing completely converted to REACT. Organizationally, responsibility for ICBMs transferred again on July 1, 1993 to Air Force Base Command. The Base Realignment and Closure Commission decided to deactivate the 321st Missile Wing at Grand Forks Air Force Base, North Dakota in 1995, and the River Transfer Program was implemented to transfer 120 Minuteman 3s from Grand Forks to Malmstrom finishing the wing's conversion to the newer missile type. The first of these transferred missiles was installed at Alpha-02 on October 19, 1995, and the last in the 10th was installed at Bravo-08 on May 15, 1998. Upgrading to REACT was not the only improvement made to the Miniman ICBM. Communication systems within the Launch Control Center were upgraded and programs to replace downstage boosters known as Propulsion Replacement Program, or PRP, and the Missile Guidance System under the Guidance Replacement Program, or GRP, were conducted. Responsibility for ICBMs transferred again on December 1, 2009, from Air Force Base Command to the newly formed Air Force Global Strike Command. The 10th Missile Squadron claimed another first on January 30, 2012, with the first ever posting all-female crews to all five LCCs within the squadron. So there, there you saw a little bit about the history of the transformation from the old console to the new console, to some upgrades, and to having an all-female crew, all-female crews actually support and man all the LCCs during a, during a missile tour, during a 24-hour period. That's the first in history that's ever been accomplished, so it's big time for the 10th Missile Squadron. Now we're moving on to some statistics of the, the Minuteman 3. It's made by Boeing, it's fast, it's uh, three stage, and it, its range is 6,000 plus miles. 
Its ceiling is 700 miles. And its original date of deployment is June 1970, production cessations, and there's been upgrades and stuff subsequently. And it's, the act it's currently active in the Air Force, obviously, and there's 450 of them currently in service. And all belong to the active duty force, none belong to reserve or Air National Guard. Now, as told, you already saw that video with uh, everything taken off, pretty amazing. Is there any questions or, or anything over that video? Um, if you don't have any questions, I'll actually start talking about the pieces of equipment that you see around the room. So first over here, so imagine yourself. You drive, you get to the MAF, you go up into the building, you go through the security guards, you hand them your key fob, your cell phone, because you can't bring any electronic items or anything downstairs, and then you take an elevator approximately 80 to 150 feet beneath your surface going straight down. You get down to the base and you have this eight ton blast door, really heavy blast door that opens up because the crews open it up because they know you arrived. It opens up and then you walk in. And as you walk in, on the first, as soon as you walk in, right before you get to the acoustical enclosure, which is the actual the aid capsule itself, you'll see pneumatic shock isolators. There's four of them in the capsule. Acts like the independent suspension in your vehicle. It uh, receives air pressure from top side, and we also have cylinders and <coughs> processes to fill up these chambers with air in case the top side pump essentially breaks down. And uh, during, like, if there's ever a, a natural disaster or a nuclear detonation, that's our independent suspension to make sure that we're not being thrown all over the place. And then you'll see the bathroom be on your right hand side as you walk in. Remember that little bathroom I was talking about? And then you'll get to the equipment racks. These are all communications and within these three equipment racks there's four modes of communication that we use. The first one is going to be your aft satcom. Satellite based, great for long distance, not good for nuclear detonations and the results of electromagnetic pulse, EMP. Pretty much dies if that ever occurs. It's built, there's several satellites in space that repeat and amplify the messages and stuff that get sent across AFSATCOM from, for command and control purposes. EHF, these are the racks for EHF. It's the uh, set up the same as our UHF rack, ultra high frequency. Goes through satellites, hits the repeaters, great for command and control and the communication between all the, the command posts and everything throughout the regions that involve that are involved in nuclear deterrence. Very survivable during an EMP, it's built to regenerate itself and continue to keep sending the signals that are go through it. VLFLF, very survivable as well. It's receive only though. We can't communicate out over VLFLF. It is old Navy type communication. They used it in submarines. And believe it or not, VLFLF, there's a big antenna that's buried out there at the sites. Almost looks like, you know those mixers that you can beat like cake mixes and stuff with? And it has a little web on there, steel bars that go around. You have a little antenna that faces north, south, east, and west. And you use the Earth's crust and water and everything to send the signals out for communication. Uh, well, it uses the Earth's crust to send systems out, communication out, to various places that you want it to go. And then we have the SACT. SACT is my favorite. It's the very first email. So you actually, you'll see little keyboards over here. And then we have our higher authority side. So whenever <coughs> we receive any type of messages or anything over these, it appears on our higher authority side with the message. There can be addresses if it's sacked in, whole nine yards. They can be encrypted, decrypted, plain text. We receive all that through these and that appears on the higher authority side. And then if we were to use sacked we just simply type on these keyboards, hit, a, hit initiate, then it's scrambled or message is scrambled, hits the modems, it is pushed out, and then it gets to the modems at the other end. It is then re-scrambled into the message that can be read. It's the very first email. It's very durable. It's the oldest mode of, uh, mode of communication that we have. And by far, it's the most reliable so far that I've seen. 
So I absolutely like it. We have had a recent upgrade to it. It's called the Kip 7 Mic. But outside of that, it's uh, that old car that just keeps on ticking. It's a Timex watch. It does fantastic work. And so like I had said earlier, all this communication and everything goes to the HA side of our VDUs, higher authority side. So self-explanatory, higher authority. These are the messages that we're getting from the President of the United States, um, whatever it may be, etc. And so I'll get in back onto the slideshow after that movie. I'll get into our command and control, how our chain of command and everything works so you can get a better idea of it. We'll receive a message on this side. You'll see a little toggle switch here on the console. You'll hit it over there, which allows us to take the action on a weapon system side based upon the information that's on this side. So they work hand in hand, but they're very separate. All right, and let's see. So things that people are curious about is this big metal box. That's our SAS container. When you have a SAS container and it has uh, what we call cookies or PCM in there, it's locked in there. When I go on alert, I have a lock. I'm the only one that knows the combination to that lock. And I put it here. Then the, the commander that I go out with has his or her own lock. They only know the combination on it. And then they put it here. And then when the blast door is closed, and when some special stickers are on uh, the, the panels and stuff like that, we are able to have one crew member sleep during the 24 hour period. So it's usually they take a six hour nap, uh, then they wake up, we swap, high five, the next person goes to bed, all based upon the, the, the redundancies of safety and command, of command and control using the SAS container, the stickers and the, the blast door and everything else. So let's say, for example, we get the president's the only one that can order us to execute. Okay? So let's say we get a message from him. Well, that message is going to consist of some pretty cool stuff that we actually have to open up the SAS container, open up the PCM, and verify that it's actually authentic and from the president. That's how we verify it. And then we take the appropriate actions after that message to go ahead and launch. So the president has a myriad of options that he can go, that he can use to launch. So you'll see here in order to launch, you have one, one switch, one key, one switch, and one switch. And the switches are turned and the key is turned. You notice that there's no big red buttons. You just go or anything like that. They see on the movies or the cartoons or anything like that. So the key is also contained in this container. So if we get the message, we crack it open. The president's telling us to launch. Commander is going to put it in here. Oh, and you guys saw the video and how they use their checklist and everything in coordination. They put in uh, the key and they launch in the beginning. Did you guys see that portion? Because there's a couple different launch videos that are out. I don't think we saw that sequence. All right, so we'll make sure you guys see it. Yes, that's awesome. All right, and so you'll be able to see how they coordinate and to find out what the message. There's an enabling sequence before you can launch whole nine yards. I just mentioned enabling sequence. I get excited about this stuff, so I apologize if I'm like, ah, all excited. You have an enabling sequence here. It's a switch. So when we get that indication from the president saying, yep, our higher states of readiness saying, yep, you gotta enable your sorties, we're getting ready to launch, we flip that switch. That switch, a lot of people like to refer it like uh, cocking the gun before you shoot it. I like to refer it as flowers before a date. If you want your date to be successful, you're going to buy the lovely lady flowers before you actually go out there on the date. So that's your enable. All sorties have to be enabled before they can launch. Each capsule can only deliver one launch vote. Okay? So uh, there's certain codes and everything. As soon as we turn the switches, goes through that huge network, uh, intricate webbing, out to the LFs that are, uh, out to all the LFs, and then there's a certain address, and the missile that's actually being launched is gonna say, oh, that's me, I'm ready to go. I just need one more launch vote. And there's a couple ways we can do that. One, we have, as you know, there's Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo in the squadron. One of them just has to key turn as well to provide that second launch vote. All right. So now you're probably thinking, well, what if two people just go crazy, heaven forbid, and they, they try to do all this stuff? Well, there's several things that we can do to make sure it never happens. One, it's the personal reliability program that you've met Colonel Walters. 
before I go out on the alert and stuff like that for the 10th missile squadron, I sit down with him. And he literally makes sure that everybody is mentally focused and ready to go out on alert. That's one method of safety and security and uh, nuclear surety of our weapons. The next, over here on the launch control panel, you'll see an inhibit switch. So an inhibit switch allows us, we'll receive weapon system indications. Like I said previously, all weapon system indications come on this side. We'll receive indication, hey, there's a launch boat out there. Or hey, why is this uh, sortie being enabled? Things like that. We hit the inhibit switch and then it cancels cancels the enable and can cancel out one launch vote. So those are all the redundancies that we have in place to ensure that nothing happens. Now, what if there's only one capsule that's surviving? They deliver their launch vote. Well, there's a bird that flies around too that can deliver a second launch vote. And with their security implementations or redundancies in place to ensure that they're coordinating and not just one or the other can do it. So it's very redundant, very safe, very powerful. And those are why we have all the redundancies. This is a printer. I like to draw, so I'll tear some off and doodle and stuff like that when I'm on alert. And what else do we got up here that would be interesting to you all? I think that's about it for that. I um, already talked about the pneumatic shock isolators. Sir, right behind you, uh, there's an EACU. That is an air conditioning unit downstairs in the capsule with us. So there's a generator, a huge air conditioning unit topside that normally day to day provides air to the equipment and the personnel down in the capsule. Well, what if Montana power dies and that has no power or anything like that? That bad boy will automatically kick on and then it'll take the place of the air conditioning unit topside and it'll pump air into all those electronic equipment racks and we'll be able to uh, not roast down there as well. So, and then you'll have right back here, it's the LCDB. That's pretty much the circuit breaker board, just like in your house. A little more old school though. And each of these is responsible for a piece of equipment or something that's down there in the, down here in the capsule. We receive all of our power topside. And when, um, when we receive all, if, if that ever dies, we have 16 batteries underneath the capsule floor that allow us to continue on with our mission if power ever dies topside. Well, we can cut off power to topside too using this and or if uh, something catches on fire, we can isolate the fire actions using these circuit breakers to cut the energy and stuff to them. <coughs> so do you guys have any questions or anything over any of the equipment or anything that you see around you? You talk about topside now. I worked at uh, Grand Forks FE in Minot, and each one of those the support building was across the tunnel. Top. That's not the way these are built in this wing. Well, sir, our our MAF, uh, the support building and stuff like that. I know exactly what you're talking about. Our our MAF is sort of our support building, and then it, it has uh, certain rooms that go in. And it's not really It's not built on, really on top of the capsule. It sort of is, but not all the time. Um, but it's still underground. The same it, it, same elevation. Uh, the no, sir. Our capsules and stuff we don't have we don't have that. Okay. So as soon as you go downstairs in the tunnel junction, you know, at your at FE Warren and and Minot, they have that huge open space. Right. We don't have any of that. Okay. You you come to, that was that was in like hey they, this extra space and support would be nice. We were the first built, so that was an afterthought after Malmstrom was built. So we would go downstairs. As soon as you get out the elevator, bam, there's the blast door. Okay. Just enough room for the blaster to open up, store some MREs on the side, and that's all, that's all the room we have. Okay. 